Thank you for that introduction, Heather, and thank you for inviting me to speak on Sloan and to return to uh, a, a project I hadn't had an opportunity to think about in a while. So I rethought it for this presentation, and hopefully out of discussion, I will have the opportunity to rethink it even more. So from the billboard on the extreme left and curving outward to the blank section on the far right, the urban fabric and coffee line fades to black, merging with the nighttime sky above Madison Square. A cluster of orange lights indicate the presence of Madison Square Garden, while another pair of warm lights, which does not show up on the reproduction, but are there, um, perhaps reference the 11-story Metropolitan Life offices like the tips of icebergs, the lights are the tops of structures blanketed by the dark. This effect is heightened by the strong foreground lighting that overpowers some of the obscured buildings behind the streetlight's glare. Instead of, seeing the th see instead of seeing the three IRT stations that sat on top of 23rd Street at the intersections of 4th Avenue, now Park, 3rd Avenue, and 2nd, there's nothing but night in the direction of the East River. In, the later, in Sloan's later New York scenes, uh, he does not have scissors. It's all filled up. Like Manhattan's densely built gridiron, each part is stuffed with the brick a brack and hurly-burly of the city. The voids and coffee lines set it apart from Lo Sloan's later New York oeuvre. Something else sets this painting apart. The proto-abstract rendering of the men in the coffee line Indeed, like the voids I just mentioned, this seems to be part of the same package of representation through absence. Rather than Sloan's familiar urban, urban types, these are dark marks arrayed in a line and thrown into silhouette by the harsh arc lamps behind them. Unlike the later paintings, in Coffee Line, no face emerges as a point of identification. This is no small point. As everybody here knows, Sloan's reputation from uh, 1905 right up to the present, is that of a painter of humanity who engenders, in the words of David Peters Corbett, the, quote, possibility of empathy and who, quote, evokes, the res evokes a response at an individual level. At this early painting, which is admittedly an outlier, Sloan is up to something different than he is later. Um, in what follows, I contextualize this painting in Sloan's early New York years and argue its unconscious political commitment, a phrase the artists used to describe these pre-socialist paintings. Um, I also want to touch on his uh, period fears about urban, era, or urban groups as seen through the progressive era literature on crowd psychology and a kind of fear of crowds and immigrant hordes in general. Sloan later captioned this painting uh, uh, with, with the following statement. Winter night, Fifth Avenue at Madison Square, a long line of cold and hungry men waiting their turn for a cup of coffee. This gratuity was a kindly gesture on the part of one of the newspapers. People waiting at line for handouts were a common New York sight. In response to the Panic of 1893 and mass unemployment, Joseph Pulitzer's New York World gave out loaves of bread from a wagon emblazoned with the newspaper's logo. The Herald and the Tribune, two competitors, quickly followed. One of the better-known lines was that of Louis Fleischmann's Model Vienna Bakery at Broadway and Ninth, uh, Ninth Street. And for those of you who know New York, it's like two blocks from where the Strand is today. Um, uh, the New York Times wrote about Fleischmann's uh, breadline and said the following, it has become one of the sites as well as institutions of this great city. Indeed, Fleischmann's was an important enough New York site for Moses King's 1914 guide to feature an entry on it. Talk about slumming, right? Go watch people uh, wait for handouts. The juxtaposition of the coffee line with the concentrated capital of skyscrapers and luxurious hotels was a political statement, albeit one without the strident didactic clarity or to um, and tone of his cartoons for the masses or the socialist journal, The Coming Nation. As any New Yorker knew, fancy hotels and restaurants ring the square, the Fifth Avenue Hotel, the Brunswick, 
and on, on the north, square's north side, and Delmonico, the city's most expensive and storied restaurant, whose dinner parties were covered by the society pages. All of those were right there on Madison Square. In Sloan's line, in Sloan's coffee line, the white block on the wagon advertising the newspaper underwriter is counterposed um, to a view into an upper story room, perhaps a fancy hotel that reveals a richly hued red interior. Its warmth and strong color contrast uh, sharply with the grisaille of the men outside. These marks, these squares mark the distance between affluence and poverty. One advertises warmth and comfort and seclusion while the other hawks a paper and a handout. Can everybody see the red square? What's this? This is not. By combining nighttime and distinct forms in an urban setting, Sloan made Coffee Line into a modified Whistlerian Nocturne Avis. I promise I, I didn't add this last night. <laughs> I was, uh, <laughs> Rebecca, can, <laughs> Rebecca can confirm that. Um, indeed, there's even an amber light in the mysterious distance, like those Whistler inserted along in towers along the Thames. Recall Whistler's lines from the 10 o'clock lecture, which we heard last night. The evening mist closed the riverside with poetry as with a veil, and the poor buildings lose themselves in the dim sky, and the tall chimneys become campanile. A collection of New, York tall, New York's tall buildings vaporize in the night, while, the foreground, uh, while in the foreground robustly painted men stand in cold gray slush. It's as if he's grounded the nocturne. The upper half and right side is airy and insubstantial, while the lower half has its feet stuck in the proverbial mud of a, New York, of a snowy New York street. Even if he painted Coffee Line before he joined the Socialist Party in December of 1909, it's the, clear the painting has a message regarding the proximity of wealth to deprivation. Before his formal membership in the party, his diary entries testify to his disgust at economic disparities and his support of radical solutions. By his own admission, Sloan later sequestered his fine, his fine art from his overtly uh, politically engaged art. However, he allowed, that, he allowed that the line was blurred before 1910. This is Sloan speaking. There's also much talk today in the 1930s about socially conscious painting. My old work was unconsciously very much so, especially before I became a socialist. After that, I felt that such things should not be put into painting. Perhaps the nocturne brought down to earth is a good way to think about Sloan's unconscious political commitments, partially obvious, partially hidden, half in, uh, half in the ethereal darkness, half in the brown slush of a New York winter. In aesthetics and politics balance out. Fairy Slip Winter is also from Sloan's early New York period and contains the same unremitting bleakness. Commuters jostle to exit a ferry in choppy water and harsh weather. In this painting and coffee line, groups of human beings are unarticulated patterns of paint. To understand the significance of these abbreviated marks and their contribution to the overall tone, let's compare it with its sibling painting, Wake of the Fairy, one, uh, that's at the Phillips Collection, um, which is from uh, March of 1907, which is roughly a year after Fairy Slip Winter. So these two paintings are separated by about a year. Both paintings focus on the gangway of the ferry where passengers enter and exit, but do so from widely different viewpoints. Ferry slip from the stability of dry land and wake of the ferry from a lilting interior of a floating vessel hitting waves. Instead of a slow roll, the frozen ferry bumps its way into the slip. Like insect mandibles, the frozen ferry slides, sides clamp around the messy conglomeration of hurried commuters. In the wake of the ferry, the congealed mass of brown passengers is replaced by a lone figure. A crowd has been replaced by an individual, the crowd's antithesis, who serves as a stable and peaceful, peaceful point of identification for the viewer. A clue to the significance of Sloan's indistinct rendering of, of, of crowds lies in Everett Shen's series, New York by Night, and drawings related to that series. In Lunch Wagon, 
are these two. Um, there are silhouettes, as well as a sensitive use of emptiness, surface, and reflection to suggest substance. Part of the series, Fleischmann's Breadline, um, could have been very well was a model for Sloan. I think it was. Two figures stand on the right of the foreground, like signposts that identify the rest of the line as being composed of people. Reading the line from right to left, the, mer the men merge into a bumpy singularity that merely hints at individual bodies. The, interv the intervals between the men disappear into a continuous tube enveloped in a pastel sfumato of darkness and snow. In the distance, the other line has no articulation of bodies whatsoever. Like Sloan, Shin allows the line to disappear behind a building to allow us to imagine it snaking on forever down Manhattan streets. A related work by Shen, now at the St. Louis Art Museum, is a charcoal sketch with touches of watercolor or gouache. Its scene is located beneath the Brooklyn Bridge's approach ramp in an area called the Brooklyn Bridge Crush. I'd say this is on the Manhattan side. A uh, staircase leads from the bridge deck to street level where pedestrians catch streetcars for their onward journey. Shin drew a major node of New York's met, uh, transportation network where the only bridge between Manhattan Bro and Brooklyn connected with ground transportation. After the Brooklyn Bridge's completion in 1883, another bridge uh, over the East River was not finished until 1903 when the Williamsburg Bridge opened. The effacement of the figures who merged into an irregular pattern of shadows on the stairs and on the platforms waiting for the streetcar is the charcoal analog to the daubs of paint in Sloan's Fairy Slip Winter. Shin's drawing was mounted onto a secondary sheet that shows a chaotic scene in which a group races to an unseen goal like a pack of dogs. The shadowy effect, the shadowy silent crowd of the primary image could transform into a stampeding, shouting, irrational one um, in a, in the, that's shown on the margins. Like medieval marginalia, where an illuminator could exercise his imagination, Shin dreamt of panicking and potentially dangerous commuters in a space outside the primary image. Indeed, the area where Brooklyn Bridge trolleys let off passengers was the subject of frequent complaints. The New York Times reported on, the Brooklyn, reported on what was called the Brooklyn Bridge Crush. During manif manif malfunctions of the trolleys that ran on the bridge, the entire system seized up at the point Shen portrayed. The Times talked of near catastrophes being averted only by the intervention of police who subdued crowds. A 1905 newspaper article reports that, quote, thousands of men and women pushed and shoved first one way, then the other, close quotes, onto the side streets that fed onto the bridge. What emerges is a consistent, uh, what I hope has emerged is a consistent association of what I'm calling proto-abstraction with social outcasts and with the mercurial nature of urban crowds. Coffee Line and Ferry Slip Winter channel widespread contemporary anxiety about urbanization, immigration, and the expanding electorate. These fears found an outlet in the form of crowd psychology, which had taken root in some American social science departments. Indeed, Robert E. Park, one of the founders of the Chicago School of Sociology at the University of Chicago, wrote a dissertation at Heidelberg on crowd psychology. Crowd literature percolated from academia into widely si circulated publications. A March 1898 uh, editorial in The Nation argued that the lies of yellow journalism and financial um, uh, chicanery uh, of the stock market were crowd actions. Writing in a December 1900 issue of the Atlantic Monthly, Gerald Stanley Lee wrote, quote, the crowd principle is so universal, it worked through modern life that the geography of the world has been shaped to conform it. The crowd was everything and nothing, an elastic catch-all for the turn of the century's problems. One theme emerges within this body of writing that turns us back to Sloan's paintings. Mental space, the space of individuation, is elided with physical space, as if physical crowding and the mentality of the crowd were the same. The sociologist, uh, period sociologist Edward Ross wrote, in the dense throng, individuality wilts and droops. Boris Cetus, a Harvard-trained sociologist, says something very similar. Now, nowhere else, except perhaps in solitary confinement, are the voluntary movements of men so limited as they are in the crowd 
Intensity of personality is in inverse proportion to the number of aggregated men. Cetus is saying that c compression and the lack of space erases the individual. Similar compression and non-individuation exist in Stephen Crane's The Men of the Storm. Crane tells of a story of men gathering in front of a charitable organization as a blizzard descends on New York. As the snow has begun to fall and nighttime draws near, the men gather before the, charity closed, uh, clo the charity's closed waiting door to be let in. Cr Crane's description of the men huddled together merged them into a single entity. Frank, uh, Crane uses phrases such as, they were all mixed in one mass so thoroughly, or pressed so close to one another like sheep in a winter's gale, or a thick stream of men forced away down the stairs. They are one body that's unruly, swearing on the edge of descending into violence. To heighten this effect, Crane singles out a policeman who's trying to control them, as well as, as and also a well-dressed man who appears in the window of a dry goods store across the street. These two figures, the policeman and the well-dressed man, are individuated. It is against them that the crowd reacts, either by following the cop's orders as he yells and tries to get them to calm down, or by starting to jeer at the well-dressed man who quickly disappeared from the window. These two comparatively fleshed out characters stand against the mass of men. In coffee line and fairy slip winter, there are no individuals, rather a mass of people put together. Individuals are subsumed into an ephemeral collectivity, a crowd, with its connotations for being mercurial, shifting from sedate to vicious in moments, um, like the panic or soon-to-be panic commuters in Shen's drawing, or the clamoring men in Crane's story, where it, it, the moment that they sense the door of the charity might be opened. So far, my argument has been about the elastic metaphor of the, how elastic the metaphor of the crowd was and how pervasive it was, something that Sloan surely picked up in the broad, pervasive discourses of the period. Um, I want to conclude by making a biographical turn, something more specific to Sloan. In a letter written to Henry, Shortly after his arrival in New York, he, Sloan sketched his large floor-through apartment that faced very busy 23rd Street. On the right side, there's a smattering of curly cues and wiggling lines, which he labels, uh, which he labels big, busy, busy throng on 23rd Street. Susan Filinier has argued that this letter shows Sloan's penchant for directly observe realism. The drawing's circular forms are men's summer hats, which she says, um, were still worn in mid-September when the letter was written. Perhaps they depict men's straw hats, skirts billowing, and legs seen from above, stretched out mid-stride, but I'm not so possible that one can be sure. Some of those marks are definitely just dots and dashes. The patterning suggests movement, like Leonardo da Vinci's ex exercise of staring at a dirty wall to imagine fantastic landscapes from the strain, stains and decay of old masonry walls, these ink jottings conjure, conjure a link to the observed world in the viewer's mind. However, without the verbal tag offered by the letter, I think these marks would be meaningless. The text, in the text of the letter, he betrays anxieties about his newfound career as an art teacher. It is clear from the letter that in correspondence from the previous week, Henry, then on vacation, um, had asked Sloan to substitute for him at the New York school. Sloan is reporting back on his experiences in class. Dear Henry, well, I've been doing the professor act. I did my little stunt, not too much scared, I hope, in the head of class at the, in the evening men's life. This morning, I tackled the men's day life. The sense of responsibility certainly seems to rather awe me. I feel as though I should have, I, sh as though sh I should ever regularly teach it. Would would it would be like taking holy orders in the church? There is a lack of confidence and a distinct diffidence to Henry. Sloan's phrases, "the professor act in my little slut or stunt," undercut his own uh, authority, as does the ironic hyperbole of responsibility akin to holy orders. In another letter from around the same time, Sloan crouches amidst the skyscrapers of Manhattan, perhaps a little afraid of big city life, the threat of failure, not having enough money to, su to survive, or the gaily grind of being packed into an elevated car that, as we learned, could, things could go kind of dicey pretty quickly with an elevated car. 
Maybe, just maybe, Sloan saw a bit of himself in these urban crowds, whether commuters or men waiting for coffee, um, aware, or someone, or Sloan as a commuter, aware of how a tightly packed streetcar could become dangerous, or how quickly economic setbacks could put someone on the street. In any case, this dreary, even menacing tone was one that he soon enough abandoned. Thank you.